Great, thank you. So um, I have a mobile phone in my hand, uh, not so much as a prop, but really just to, uh, to talk about um, digital uh, biomarkers. There are a lot of uh, companies that are looking at the complex data that we're collecting all the time through our wearables on our phones. And uh, we have uh, Pete Ward, who's uh, joining us today. There he is. Hi, Pete, uh, from Humanity. Um, really one of our pioneering apps in the, in the longevity field. And uh, Pete's just in from America. <laughs> hey, Pete. Good, Good to see you. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I'm Pete Ward. I'm co-founder of Humanity. And uh, it's fascinating to hear the last presentation because a lot of it was obviously focused on the future of longevity and how we can transform that uh, and bring it to the, as many people as possible. I don't personally believe we have to only think about this in the sense of biotech, and I'll tell you why. We have a, a, a consumer app. We're the number one app in, in the app store uh, for the keyword health span. And it's called Humanity for a reason. We want to impact as many people as possible rather than just the privileged few. And essentially, our laser focus is to help everybody slow their aging. We have a big mission. Our mission is to give a billion years of health back to humanity by the end of this decade. And so if we're going to achieve that, we need to raise all ships and we need to be open and collaborative with everybody and get our platform to a few hundred million users at least. And we have that experience. So my co-founder and I have not come from the health industry. Um, and this, is, I think, is an, an indicator of where longevity is going as well, because we're innovators, we're disruptors. And we worked in a completely different field. I was in uh, travel social networking. My co-founder launched the largest dating site in the world called Badu. We both sold those companies. And Mike also launched a consumer VPN that reached a, a, almost a billion users. So between us, we know how to grow and scale consumer-based platforms to hundreds of millions, if not billion users, um, and really you know, make, make them engaged around that topic. It's just through personal circumstances, like many of us who've lost loved ones, like my dad got a stroke at the age of 62, um, uh, Mike's uh, uh, family member and love, uh, so high school friend also got diagnosed with breast, late stage breast cancer. And that left us feeling completely helpless as to how we can help our loved ones and frankly, any of us. And so we all know this. We all know why aging is much more important than just looking at end-stage diseases. If we cure cancer, as I learned just recently from looking at Kristen's uh, presentation in Vegas, we're only going to add another four years to our lifespan. And if we cure all, you know, even another one of those diseases, maybe another year or two, whereas if we actually focus on how we keep us fully functional for as long as possible, then that really can be you know, the real dividend of longevity and health span for you know, 10 to 20 years, even without us actually having to invent a new drug to achieve that. And, and, you know, and it's a big problem because something happens clearly when we hit our 40s and 50s, and particularly in our 60s and 70s. And as you guys are in this space, you'll know it's the, it's the leading uh, cause of most you know, non-communicable diseases, and has clearly had a huge impact on what led people to get really sick with COVID as well. And just to be clear on what we're focused on, we're actually not focused on lifespan uh, or longevity in its you know, ultimate sense, that just to get somebody to live to 120 or 150. <laughs> we're much more focused on how we can increase that healthy years of life, the health span period. And by, by in so doing, naturally, we're going to extend the, the lifespan as well. And so the, the, the outcome, our solution to this problem is, is to make it as simple as possible. So we have a consumer app that's, if you like, like the calm for longevity, uh, so that every man and his dog can understand how to use it, how to benefit from it. And essentially, it does two things. It helps you monitor your rate of aging or biological age. And secondly, guides you to slow it down. Think of it like a ways for traffic, but for health. So like Waze knows where you are on your journey. And based on other people who took a similar journey before you, it can use data and data science to take you on the most optimal route, and it can tell you how long it will get you there in a high precision number of minutes. And so we've boiled that down into sort of three key loops, and they're all interconnected. So the first one is you know, the, 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 the feedback loop. You know, what are we actually trying to achieve? And that is your biological age and rate of aging. So 
These are based on these aging clocks that we were just discussing. Our chief scientific officer specialized that in the University of Edinburgh. And you know, we are not precious about becoming the owner of or inventor of the most accurate clock. We are happy to take the most accurate clocks that are available, that are peer reviewed and combine them into the model so that we have a closest version of truth that we can all use. Uh, and of course, contribute to that. But ultimately, we need a way to measure whether we're getting healthier or not, because if you can't measure it, you can't affect it, as Peter Drucker once said. And it is measurable, even if it's not 100% accurate, it gives you a good indication. And actually, that's driven by our AR algorithms, which, uh, frankly, we were shocked ourselves in our research of this, because we started with DNA methylation and blood biomarkers, thinking that's just the only way you can go. And then in our discovery, and partly through the inspiration of people like Kristen, who was already working at BioAge on the longitudinal data sets like the UK Biobank and, and Estonian Biobanks, we realized that we can actually use machine learning to validate the predictability of outcomes based on these predictors, even from things that are living in your pocket or your, on your wrist or on your finger, i.e. your smartphone captures a huge amount of data from its movement sensors, accelerometer, gyroscope, and so on, and that data is something that is already in the UK Biobank, for example, 100,000 participants who had the accelerometers on them and heart rate sensors. And then we can compare those movement patterns to people in the past and see what happened to these people, who got sick, who died. And the same for if, if anyone has a wearable, you know, we, can cap we can capture the heart rate movements and patterns as well. And what was astonishing to us is that the concordance, which is a statistical term to say how predictive it is, is almost as predictive as bloods. So you don't have to pierce your skin, you don't have to, all right, it can't necessarily tell you if you have high cholesterol or if your C-reactive protein is too high and you have inflammation, but it can give you a prediction of your all-cause morbidity and all-cause mortality, i.e. risk of disease and death, and tell you whether you're getting closer to it or further away from it. The heart of it, the uh, focus of the app is guidance. So I mentioned that before, the navigation engine. So this is really about uh, telling the, the user, based on whatever they've done in any given moment, what's the most impactful, most likely thing that they are to do to improve their health. And then finally, we use the age-old sort of gamified sort of mechanics and variable rewards and feedback loops that give people that sense of instant progress and gratification and positive reinforcement immediately, no matter what they've done, even if they've just gone for a walk or they've just gone about their day, so that they realize that there are small things that they can do that can make a big difference. And here's the thing that's really astonishing. We now have over 140,000 users, and we've got billions of health data points pulled in from Apple Health data, and also the users telling us themselves what they're doing day to day. And we can start to stratify how those actions are different for different people, and to what extent each action has an effect. Not just from a univariant perspective, which was something that was mentioned earlier, but from a multivariant perspective. Because once you combine all these things, you can start to see the incremental impact of each action. And that's just going to get more and more predictive, more and more powerful as we grow. I mean, it, it, it doesn't take much to work out that you, know, you have more users, you have more data. This, this, this solution becomes more predictive and exponential in its ineffectiveness as we grow. And not surprisingly, we're starting to see that already very different for gender breakdown. You know, one of the biggest problems in health is like, well, it, uh, most of the studies have been done on men. So women are following, you know, uh, guidance that's not necessarily relevant to them because it's general population guidance. And frankly, that's the old paradigm. And I think that we're moving, we will be moving even more from this, you know, gold standard of randomized controlled trials, which is obviously important from a safety perspective, towards one where you look at real-world evidence and observational studies to see whether this is actually having an effect. You know, you can, you can create a drug that lowers blood pressure, but if it doesn't increase your health span, then what is the point? You know, we should be really focused on whether the things we're doing are actually increasing our years of life, years of health, and every single intervention should be measured against that yardstick. And so to give you a sense of how you know, we do this, you know, we, we immediately drive people to change their day-to-day -day habits the moment they download the app. And this is just an illustrative example. So the, the, the bars on the left of the yellow line are the 40 days prior to someone joining humanity. And we can pull that from Apple Health data, which is really powerful. And then the, the, the right-hand side is what happens after they join. And so you'll notice two things. There's a stark increase in the movement uh, patterns 
and it's sustained beyond just the sort of, you know, one or two days or even the sort of typical time it takes to build a new habit. And that's because people suddenly start to take control of their own health and they realize this is something that they can affect. They no longer feel helpless. The other big discovery for us was that for those who are the most unhealthy or least likely to, to act were the ones who actually acted the most. So those who are actually clinically obese, you know, have a BMI of over 30, were the ones who increased their behavior even more by 18%. Those who were already super healthy did so less, like six or 7%, but nonetheless, it was still impactful. And so this is really what it's all about, guys. This is our North Star metric. This is what you know, I would like the industry to adopt as a yardstick for success, and that is years of health. Now, uh, many of you all know David Sinclair, you know, famous longevity scientist out of Harvard Med. Um, some of you all know Andrew J. Scott out of London Business School, who's a chief economist, and Martin Ellison out of the University of Oxford. Well, they got together and for the first time, they actually calculated the societal and economic impact of giving one extra year of health back to humanity. And it was calculated at 38 trillion. Now it works out to about $47,000 per year per person. So we've already accomplished over 30,000 years based on external peer reviewed models, which is the equivalent of over a billion dollars worth of health impact. And if we achieve our mission of a billion years, well, that's nearly 50 trillion. So really, this is my uh, message to you guys is I can't do this on my own. We can't do this on our own. We need to go out there and raise the rooftop on this massive problem that needs solving. 100,000 plus people are dying every single day. We've just hit 8 billion people, but that is going to start to go down. And it doesn't affect birth rates. It's actually about keeping us with our loved ones for as long as possible. And we don't have to wait for the organoids to come up with our replacement organs and keep us alive for another 20 years. We can act today to give us another 20 years of health. And we will help contribute towards that by building a system that will ultimately become one of the world's largest biobanks for preventative health. And we'd love to collaborate with as many of you as possible as we start to give people that understanding of what's working, most importantly, for them. Thank you very much.